Good morning, everybody. How's it going? Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. We've got a real treat. This past week at Christ Church was VBS, and the kids down here this morning, this is about a tenth of the kids that we had here this, this week. It was, a, it was a madhouse in the most wonderful way this past week around here. And we're going to sing for you the theme song for the week, I'm Trusting You. Kids, you ready? Here we go! on this platform, leading us in worship, telling us, reminding us that he is good. That is just good news. That's what we get to sing about. Um, the, the kids are going to stay up here and help us read our opening scripture this morning. But I wanted to um, just, these two right here, this is Asher and he's nine and this is Addie down here and she's six and um, they've had two very busy weeks because they came on the mission trip to Black Mountain Homes and these kids worked their tails off. He, Asher got a saw at one point and a nail gun and, and Addie was uh, cooking with Miss Becky. She learned her secret peach cobbler recipe. So you you can ask her about that later. Um, but these guys were so amazing and served um, these last two weeks. And you'll hear more about that trip a little bit later. But kids, will you all join with me as we read our opening scripture? It's Psalm 95, verses 1 through 7. And if you can't read it, just smile real big, okay? <laughs> so let's all stand and let's read this together. Come. 
Let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing songs of praise to him. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. He holds in his hands the depths of the earth and the mightiest mountains. The sea belongs to him, for he made it. His hands formed the dry land too. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. If only you would listen to his voice today. This is the, this is, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. 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 Kids, you guys can take your seats and continue worshiping with us. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord and to join across all ages, across all cultures, to come together in the midst of our differences and to proclaim the goodness of our God together. We're gonna sing this song that I know many of you know, in Christ alone, my hope is found. So would you join with us as we sing together? Here we go. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, and my soul. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm to the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on the Oh 
here in the power of Christ will stand. Well, as we continue in worship, we have two invitations, and we make these each week. One is an invitation to prayer. The other is an invitation to the Lord's beautiful, extended, wide, never-ending table that's been set and prepared for us. So when we continue in worship in just a moment after I pray, there's going to be a team of folks here in front of the platform that are ready to join and partner with you in prayer through the joys of life and the challenges of life. So if you have any need or anything you're celebrating or anything that you're grieving or anything that you're concerned about, any need, they would love to join you on this journey and stand with you in prayer. We also have the Lord's table to celebrate today. And there's going to be stations, three stations in front of the platform and two stations on either side of the balcony. And you can just simply go to one of those stations and someone will give you a piece of bread and you will dip it in the juice and share in communion that way. But as we get ready for this moment, particularly the moment to, to share in this beautiful meal, we're always kind of reminded of the sacredness of this meal, and, and we feel a little bit like, are we invited? Is this table for us? And the answer is yes. And we, we just kind of ready ourselves and prepare ourselves for this moment through praying a prayer of, of confession. And these aren't magic words. You can say your own words. But we offer these as common words that we can say together in this moment. So would you join me? Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. It's my joy to tell you that you are invited to God's table, that he has forgiven you all your sins, that he separated you from them as far as the east is from the west, and that he has chosen to remember them no more. This is, a, this is not the table of Christ church. All are welcome here. This is one little piece of the eternal table that's being celebrated all over the world today and that will be celebrated in generations to come. Will you pray with me? Father, we're grateful for this feast that you've laid before us, for this bread that we lift up. Lord, that we pray that your spirit would descend on and make of it something greater than just the natural elements that are before us, but make of it food and medicine for our bodies and our minds and our hearts and our souls and our relationships. And Lord, we lift up this cup and we pray, Lord, that your spirit would descend on it and make it into a medicine to unite us with all of your family, whoever was and is and is to come. Keep us, Lord. Keep us firmly in the palm of your hand. We thank you for this meal. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Worshiping together, I kept um, hearing a word that one of our youth students had this last Wednesday in our youth group. And she came up to Pastor Scott during um, our time of corporate worship, and she was like, I don't know if this is the Lord or not, and kind of just talked to him, and, she's, and Scott was like, yes, definitely. And it was just talking about being bold before the Lord, being bold before the Lord. And I'm not going to steal all of her words of what she had to say, but as I was, as we were worshiping, I was just feeling that call of the father's heart saying, remind my children that they can be bold before me as a good father. Remind my children that the gifts that I have for them are goodness and kindness and mercy and grace and peace and reconciliation and redemption and that I actually do know their names because I formed them. I hemmed them in behind and before, before their mothers knew their name, I called them out. And 
always feel a little funny too in these moments where I feel like God is speaking to somebody in this room and telling me to just open my mouth so I am being obedient, but I just feel like the Lord is reminding somebody in this space and maybe even us as a congregation that we can be bold before our Father. No matter our age, no matter our background, no matter our woundedness, no matter our fears, no matter our questions, there is nothing, there is no shadow that he won't light up, right? No mountain he won't climb up. We just sang this truth. And so I just want to remind us of that word that came to me in a powerful way through one of our youth, that we can come and approach our Father with boldness. So God, this morning, we just thank you that you are in our midst. We thank you that you dwell among us. We thank you that we can say, come Holy Spirit, and also acknowledge that your spirit's already here. We thank you that there is nowhere that we can go from your presence. Nowhere where we can go where your love will not find us is not already around us, is not already calling us to your heart. For those who bring woundedness in this space, I pray that they feel the overwhelming love and goodness and kindness of your heart for all of us. And as we're singing these truths over ourselves, that there's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up coming after me, that as we are able to live in the truth of that for our own lives, that that is then what we call others to. Because that truth is not just for us individually, it's for all of the children of God. <laughs> What a gift that is. And so may this be a place where people can see that, yes, the love of God is even for me, right where I am. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. We are continued to be yielded to whatever you have for us this morning. Come and have your way. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we say, so be it. Amen. Amen. And now as we continue in our worship, if, um, if you have a child in grades one through six who wants to uh, continue their time of worship and learning in the Children's Worship Center, you are invited to go ahead and head out there. Um, if you're not sure where to go, uh, somebody in the back of either level will help show you where to go. And now would you walk across the aisles and greet each other in the peace of Christ. Good morning, online family. So glad that you're here today. You know what? You get to hear Pastor and Linda and I so many weeks of the year that we decided today to bring in special guests. We have Jason, Nicole, Renee, and they're going to share some very important information with you. Here's the mic. Well, good morning, everyone. We are honored to be with you. We hope you've had a great week, and we hope that the week that is coming up is going to be amazing as well. But fathers... We honor you this morning, we love you, whether you're a spiritual father, whether you are a natural father or both. We hope you're gonna get some great rest and relaxation today. And now Nicole's got a very cool uh, message that she wants to share. So basically we have Renee Hardwick here and she is going to tell us some really fun stuff about upcoming events and we're so honored that she's here joining everyone today and wants to give this to you. So. Hello everyone. I'm so excited to tell you about a great benefit concert that's going to happen right here at Christ Church this Thursday night, June 20 at 7 o'clock. We will have a massive choir on stage that will be 400 plus voices along with special guest artist Janice Gaines. Michael Farron and Joseph Habedank. This entire concert event is uh, put together to benefit the Bridge Ministry, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. We will be raising donations and funds for homeless teens in Nashville. You can find more information about that on the Christchurch website, and we hope that you'll make plans to join us this Thursday evening at 7 o'clock. Be blessed this week. Again, happy Father's Day. We have a lot of people up here on this platform for dedicating two little children. And I thought Christopher was going to start playing Isn't She Lovely? And I thought if I could remember the lyrics. But I, I thought it's a little bit over the top. Let's go! Whoa! Isn't it? That's pretty good, right? How many of you were alive when that was... Uh, 
recorded. For, uh, I know you were. And you, you were live, weren't you? No. No, he was not. I've listened to it enough to make up. Yeah, that's right. That's pretty good. That's scriptural. We didn't know who love would be, making one as beautiful as he. Okay, Stevie Wonder stuff isn't working this morning for me. So. so we are dedicating to the Lord today, Daniel Ray Mast. He is here. And it's not, even though he's not a she, he's lovely too, right? And look at you. I like your hat. And Bonnie Lee Susanna Boyette. That's a long name and it's a beautiful name and beautiful girl. Okay, so... <clears throat> the word of the Lord says in the gospel of St. Luke chapter 2, when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. <laughs> and he was doing that too, probably. And, and there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And inspired by the Spirit, he came into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and he blessed God. I th I'll always love this story because those of us, the older we get, the more we sometimes wonder if the next generation will, you know, uh, will come up in the ways of the Lord. But the Lord promised that he would never fail to send us a generation of people faithful and he has completed that ever since Abraham. That's what Simeon was blessing God about. The privilege of parenthood is God giving and you are responsible to him for the way you rear your child and so you've come in this fitting way to the Lord to present your children to the Lord. As a household of faith and the family of God, we the members of this church congratulate you to bring your children, the children of your love and the love of your heavenly father and we want you to know that God is pleased with this observance of this custom, and there's a real blessing that's conveyed through this custom. Do you, the members of this church, receive these children, Daniel Ray Mast and Bonnie Lee Susanna Boyette, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and promise to be to them fathers, <clears throat> other brothers, sisters, and friend, and if so, would you say in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will. Amen. And do you parents and grandparents and uncles and aunts and friends and all that may be up here, uh, do you promise to dedicate your children to the Lord and promise as elder children of your heavenly Father to pray for them and, and with them in the knowledge and the love of God? If so, would you say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will. So... As I'm going to pray, and so Pastor Sean and uh, Linda too, or just Sean, is going to be anointing this children's head that they would think they mind, uh, have the mind of Christ. Anoint their hands, they will do the work of Christ, and anoint their feet that they would walk in the ways of Christ. Lord, how precious these families are to us. They are microcosm of our own large family here at Christ Church and your family throughout the world and throughout time. Ever since Abraham, we've been dedicating our children. And here, once again, we're dedicating our children. We know, Lord, you will preserve these children and keep them in your ways. And that as they grow older, they will face trials and they will face challenges and opportunities and blessings. And in all of this, you will form them in the kind of person that will be able responsibly to carry the covenant of God forward into the future until you come for us. And all the people of God said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. What a wonderful day to celebrate a baby dedication, right? Happy Father's Day to all of them. Happy Father's Day to you. If you're not a father, we just dedicated ourselves to help them in the process of raising their children. So that means be in the back and you can take one home this afternoon for the afternoon. I'm sure they will be appreciative of that, right gang? <laughs> it's so good to be here today. I do wanna remind you that next Saturday, I believe, June the 23rd 
and the 24th, is it June 20, 22 and 23, we are going to celebrate Pastor Dan. And <laughs> it's really surreal that this time has come. Uh, there are no words that can express what all we all want to say. So we're going to give you the opportunity to come on June the 22nd at 3 o'clock to come and be a part of a celebration. And then on Sunday, we will celebrate again for those who could not come on the Saturday. So make sure you have marked your calendar because I know you want to be there. On the 23rd, to follow up celebrating, we're all going to have lunch together at Come to the Table up in Montel Hardwick Hall. How many of you have never been to a come to the table lunch? Some. Okay, this is a great time to fellowship, a great meal. And let me read to you what we're gonna have because that's important. We're gonna have pulled pork or chicken, rotini and cheese, beans, coleslaw, rolls, cake, banana pudding, which was always Pastor Hardwick's favorite, and tea, coffee, water, and all of this is for $5. And this is going to benefit the kids' camp and the club nights. So you definitely want to come and be a part of that. So uh, mark your calendar, June 22nd and June 23rd. It's a very important weekend. Now, I want to show you something, so I'm going to put this down. Okay, for a long, long time, everybody's wanted a t-shirt. We have a t-shirt. So this will be a t-shirt <laughs> that we can wear when we go to events, when we go to the bridge, when we go out together. This will be a great, great t-shirt to wear so we can spot each other, find each other, do your work around your neighborhood, advertise the church. Those shirts are on sale today. They're $20, all sizes, and they, I think there's some even long sleeve shirt shirts out there. So make sure you get a shirt today because you really want to be a part of this when we go out and serve together. The opportunity is coming up June the 20th. One of the ways that you can serve is that we have partnered with Some Power, which brings in teens to uh, teach them all week long about worship, and Lifeway, which Lifeway is amazing. And we're partnering with them to bless the bridge ministry. They're going to be doing a concert here on June the 20th, and all of the proceeds will be helping the bridge. The way that you can come into the concert as entry fee is for you to bring a gift for a teen. And that's going to go to the bridge, and they're going to distribute those gifts. It's always easy to collect gifts for children, and sometimes our teens, it's a little harder. So we wanted to do something extra special, and this concert is going to do that. So our very own Phil, where's Phil? Our very own Phil is going to be part of that evening. Joseph Habedank is going to be part of that evening and others. So don't want, you do not want to miss that night, June the 20th. If you say, I don't really know what to buy a teen, you can buy a ticket for $10. Renee Hardwick, who is with Lifeway, will be in the foyer today to talk to you about that. And I'm going to ask now for Dave Chumley to come to the platform. A few weeks ago, about two weeks ago, 34 people went to Black Mountain, North Carolina. Y'all, I believe we, it was a trip of a lifetime. I believe we missed it if we didn't get to go. And I didn't get to go on this one, but I'm going on the next one. It's amazing the stories that have come from this week. Can you imagine being someplace for six days and every waking moment that you were there, you were doing something to help someone else, to bless a family, to winterize their home. So when you're sitting in our warm homes this winter and you went on that trip, you're gonna be blessed to know that you helped somebody get prepared for what is coming this winter. But the person that we wanna thank a lot 
is Dave Chumley. He was the project manager for this. And I just want... <laughs> this family right here is the epitome of stewardship. They serve in every capacity imaginable here at the church. If you want to learn what stewardship means, get to know these people and follow them. But we love you. We want to hear all about this. That is not why I came up here. <laughs> <laughs> I came up here to brag on the team that went and to tell you guys about all the things that we did that you sent us to do. We took 34 people to North Carolina to Black Mountain Children's Home, and they're a, an orphanage organization that takes in kids um, and loves on them and loves them well and provides for them and they've put things in place to teach them, teach them vocations and give them an amazing opportunity at life to create a good life for themselves. And so Scott came to me several months ago and said, hey, I want to take a youth trip, missions trip to North Carolina to Black Mountain Children's Home. They've got some construction needs and I'd like you to help me lead this trip and help manage that. I said, okay, we can do it. And then the decision came, hey, let's open it up to the church. And I said, okay, I'm okay with that. And I'm a pretty straightforward person. So I said, one of the things that, that I don't want to see is I don't want to see an adult hand one of our youth a flashlight and say, hold this while I work. I said, I want this to be a teaching trip. I want this to be an opportunity for all of us to bond together and do something amazing. I also don't want this to be a trip where we go and paint a block wall and sing Kumbaya and pat ourselves on the back and say we did something good. I wanted this to be something where we left something really tangible that they can use and that will benefit them. And so our goal was pretty aggressive and uh, we committed to do quite a bit. And they've got cabins that, that they're winterizing and, and what that means is that we're going in and making it where it's usable through the winter. And they're uh, they're using these cabins for staff retreats. They're using these cabins for the kids to be able to use. They're also going to rent them out to provide income uh, for the home and to be able to do cool things. And so we, we committed to doing quite a bit of work in one of these cabins. And we went. And we were able to do, because of the, the heart and the work ethic of the 34 people that went, we were able to do twice what we committed to do. We worked all across the campus. We worked on cabins, we worked on trails. They've got a dirt bike program where they teach kids how to ride, teach kids how to work on bikes, uh, mountain bikes. So we had trail crews opening up new trails, clearing trails that had storm damage, that they, they were closed. Uh, we insulated cabins, we put beadboard up, wall covering, we painted, um, we painted bunk beds that were there that, that needed to be freshened up. And, and one of the things that, that I really appreciate that Black Mountain does is they don't just provide a home and say that's good enough. They provide an excellent campus to say to these kids that you're worthy. You're worthy of, of our best. And our crew went and gave their absolute best. And I, I say our kids, they're not kids, they went and worked like adults. Um, they blew my doors off, man. The first night, the camp director, Jason, came to us and he said, I want you to know that at the end of the first day, your team has accomplished more than most teams accomplish all week long. And that's not to take anything away from anyone else that goes. Yeah. That's to tell you how hard these people worked. We would get up in the morning. We had a kitchen crew that made amazing meals for us, kept us fed. We had community at all of our meals, you know, all of our all of our teens and adults got together and joked and laughed and talked about the day and then we worked hard and when I say we worked hard I mean chainsaws dragging trees um, cutting out window openings in cabins and putting in new windows and insulating the whole cabin cleaning the whole place up these people worked hard and I'm so proud of what they accomplished and Jason came to me and he said I want you to know or he, he told all of us one night, he said, I want you to know, when you lay your heads down to sleep, just know that we're tucking in 85 kids across the street. We're praying over them. We're showing them the love of Christ. 
we didn't have to be seen. We didn't have to be heard. We knew that what we were doing directly benefited those kids. We want to do a trip again next year. So if you didn't have opportunity to go this year, jump in on that one. It'll be limited to about the same number of people that we took this year because we can be efficient and we can be productive with that. We had several of you that weren't able to go and you donated to this trip. And through that, we were able to do, like I said, more than we committed to. We were able to leave them. We were able to outfit their whole kitchen uh, that we built for them. We built a kitchen in one of the cabinets and, and bought pots and pans and appliances, all because you guys sent us and sent us well. So I want you to know that, that they did you proud and they represented the church well. And uh, if you don't know anything about Black Mountain, get online and, and look them up because they're pretty amazing. So thank you very much and happy Father's Day. If, if you went on that tri trip, please stand. We want to honor you if you went on that trip. Just stand. Let's thank these people again. Thank you, thank you. Another facet of stewardship is when we bring our tithes and offerings into the storehouse and we're preparing our hearts down to do that. Let's pray together and prepare to give. Father, we thank you so very much for all of the opportunities that you afford us to share your love. Thank you, God, for the people who went on the trip to Black Mountain. Thank you for the people who serve at the Bridge Ministries. Thank you for the people who've served at Vacation Bible School. Lord, we pray that we will be good stewards of all that you have given to us to manage. Lord, we're walking into a new season. Let there be greater opportunities. Let us serve with fuller capacity. May we give till we think we can't give anymore, but God, you're an abundant God. You never run out. So Father God, we praise you. We thank you for all that will be given today. We thank you for the people who do give and for those who cannot give at this time. We praise you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Does the Spirit dwell among us? And is Jesus our Messiah? Hope forever those He loves. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. From every people and tribe, every nation and tongue, He has made us a kingdom and priest to God to reign with His Son. God, we thank you for this opportunity we have to be in your presence in this moment, to break open the word of life and to receive for our souls, our minds, our hearts, our bodies, all of life, instruction that will keep us to eternal life, that will transform us if we take the words in. And we pray on our God that you would open our minds as we open the word. We thank you. What a blessing it is to be with you and to be in your presence today. Cherubim and seraphim bowing down before thee who works and art and ever, ever, ever shall be. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Let's read the passage today, Proverbs chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, and then 22 through 31. Does not wisdom call, and does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights, beside the way, at the crossroads, she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portals, she cries out, To you, O people, I call, and my call is to all that live. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts long ago. Ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, 
Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth when he had not yet made the earth and fields are the world's first bit of soil. And when he established the heaven, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limits so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the human race. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, I want to recognize uh, my, I have my children and grandchildren here and do you all mind standing? This is, this is, I just want to see you. So there you are, you're all one front there. Uh, and and uh, so, I, and Trish is sitting with Mr. Natalie. I see so with Natalie, so from Phoenix, and good to have you, Natalie, as well. Uh, Pastor Ben is in South, Carolina, uh, South Dakota. Big difference, South Dakota, South Carolina. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, he is visiting with his family today, and, and so we are wishing him well and praying for him as he prepares for his uh, time here. Uh, this is my last sermon to you as your pastor. Next week we'll have other things going on. Uh, and, and so I, I wondered, I know you've been waiting in bated breath for me to give my uh, swan song and closing sermon and great statement, but honestly I just couldn't trudge up anything that, that would seem that momentous. Uh, and so I read the passage of the, the week as I do and uh, the different passages and I, uh, my eyes caught on this and my heart was, uh, was sparked by Proverbs 8. <clears throat> Proverbs 8 is really interesting because it was very uh, strongly influential in, in the beginning uh, chapter, the first, book of the first chapter of the Gospel of John <clears throat> and, uh, and where the, uh, John begins to talk about uh, the Lord Jesus as pre-existing word of God, and he draws upon this passage. But let me just tell you a little bit about Proverbs in, peri- uh, in, in general. Proverbs is a part, of a, a part of Scripture that we call the wisdom literature, but Proverbs spe- uh, specifically, and the rest of wis- wisdom literature as well, wants us to know that we're all born with the potential to be, either become a wise man or a wise person or a fool. Uh, and, and these are the two paths that we have before us. And at every opportunity in our lives, every, every day of our lives, we are presented with the ability to go one way or the other. And this is a common theme of Scripture. In Psalms, it's, made, it's two paths. There's the path of righteousness, the path of unrighteousness. All the way through the Psalms, we have that. Proverbs introduces uh, folly and wisdom uh, and in the, uh, in the personification of two women. So uh, there's a, a lady wisdom and she's, you know, full of decorum and grace and she's got a meal going on and she's inviting everybody to come. She says, I have the choices of, of wine and, and food and so forth, but not too many people go. But then there's Dame Folly and she is, she is, she's got bells on her fingers and rings on her toes or whatever, how that goes. Uh, and she's constant, she's seductive and she's fun and she's delightful and she's adventuresome and almost everybody follows her and the lady wisdom's got all this food prepares and nobody goes there. There are very few people go there. And Proverbs remarks about how the masses of people go down the road to folly and remain fools in their life and they never pursue wisdom. This theme is repeated throughout the scripture and it's finally summed up in the book of Revelations as well where we also have two women, the bride of Christ uh, and, and the great prostitute, which is the same, it's the idea of prostituting uh, one's gifts and, and, and there's that uh, warning given in spiritual life that spiritual life too can be prostituted. So let's just, you know, go in a little summary of the, of the Proverbs that we get into this sermon The fool never self-corrects. The fool never listens. The fool needs no one. The fool is always sure of himself. The fool is a braggart. He is self-willed. He's haughty. He uses people. He belittles people. He doesn't 
uh, care about the development of his own character. He never really truly develops from anything. He never learns a lesson. He just keeps plodding on without learning anything. In contrast, the wise person listens to instruction even when it's difficult to hear and, and to criticism about his own life. He learns from life. He's gracious. He's humble of heart or she. And so wisdom, uh, wisdom is difficult because in, in, in becoming wise, we have to confront self. Now, that's a hard lesson to teach. It's an even a harder lesson to, um, uh, to, uh, to learn and, and to follow. But I wanted to tell you today that all of my life, I have been blessed by having uh, someone live before me and, uh, in this way and has become a wise person. So I would like to talk today on this, my last sermon to you, I would like to talk about my father who has become a wise person. To do that, I, I thought I would just take a, a, a few little um, summarizing statements from a sermon that Dad preached in 1967. And he had adapted the sermon from Peter Marshall, chaplain of the United States uh, Senate, had preached the sermon before, and so Dad had adapted it for the church that he pastored, uh, th that he would shortly be leaving in, in uh, southern West Virginia. And it was called uh, Keepers of the Spring. And so I, I have some of that before me, and, and, and it goes like this. It was, a, it was a story that really occurred in a little village um, a, a, a couple of uh, centuries ago, located in one of the most scenic places on earth, the Swiss Alps. Everybody there seemed to be physically healthy, they were relatively happy, but the village had no money uh, to do repairs and improvements, and the, the people of the village were passing through an economically difficult time. And so the town council held a meeting, uh, and, um, and they began to discuss how to cut expenses and how to increase income, which is the right thing to do. And this meeting would have unforeseen consequences in the future and for the people of this village. Because one of the, uh, co the councilmen had been reviewing a, a list of town employees and he saw something that had bothered him and which he now brought to the attention of the council. And it was that the town had been paying a small sum each year to an employee that was simply listed in the rolls as keeper of the spring. Who is the keeper of the spring, he says. Nobody knew, as it turned out. And in the following days, the council members discovered that the keeper of the spring was an old man who lived up in the mountains far above the village. Many years before, the parents and grandparents of this present council had decided to pay this man, when he was young, a small stipend. And in return, he was to keep the debris out of a little stream that ran from the glaciers down to the valley below. The council decided that night that the payment to this man, who was now very old, had been really just an act of benevolence that the town could no longer afford. And so, evidently, their counterparts in these generations before had decided to help the nice man, but like lots of expenses, this one had been over, uh, overlooked, and so year after year, it, it had just kept going to this guy. And so the man uh, had continued to receive the money year after year, and it was something the townspeople could no longer afford. And they cut that night from their budget the stipend for the keeper of the spring. They told the little boy that had been running up the mountain each month to give the old man his money to inform him of the, cha of the change. He would be given the month, that month, and then, uh, but that would be the end of his stipend. And so when the keeper of the spring got the news, he was very elderly. He decided to move into town with his niece. Everything seemed fine. The council had cut out the superfluous spending. The man was happy with his niece. Everything went well for two or three years. But on the third year, the people began getting sick. Dysentery broke out. A few old people didn't survive. Babies began to get sick with this and that, and little by little, the little town got filled with sorrow and sickness and misery, and no one seemed to realize what had happened. Finally, there was one person in town that everyone respected, made the connection between the polluted water supply and the increasing sickness, and went to the council and asked them to reinstate the keeper of the spring, and they agreed. And soon the old man went back to his work, cleaning out branches and debris from the stream high above uh, uh, the, the village. 
For a while again, nobody noticed the difference, but by the third year, the water was clean again. Health began to return to the village. I remembered this sermon years later when I was in the Bass Pro Shop, and I looked up on the, uh, on the wall and saw a sign, and the sign said, we all live downstream. The sign referred to the fact that our planet is made of many related parts that functions together in a fragile ecological process. So what happens to one part of the system slowly makes its way through the entire system. If there's a lot of space between a dead cow uh, in a stream and the community of people downriver, nature will purify the water before it makes uh, before it becomes much of a danger but the system can get overwhelmed if there's too much corruption and too little time or too little distance to correct it the system can collapse and that's why every system needs keepers of the spring people and processes that work to guarantee the purity of our water and other resources otherwise everyone downstream from corruption will suffer the consequences Fathers and mothers, pastors and CEOs, and mayors and presidents, and judges, we all either guard over the sources of life for the communities that we serve, or we pollute them. And we are responsible for the consequences now and forever. I can preach this because I have watched my father learned this sermon that he preached and he was that would have made him uh, I think 35 at that time shortly after that my father uh, made a decision to move our entire family from southern West Virginia to Quito Ecuador to the mountains Andes mountains changed us in drastic ways which I'll refer to if I have the chance but I want to talk about him today my father is one of 14 children raised on the banks of the Kanawha River, part of the ex extended family that first moved into the Appalachian Mountains prior to the Revolutionary War. That family made their living through farming and fishing and uh, trapping and uh, coal mining. And that's just about the extent of it. And my father was engaged in constant work, odd jobs, to care for me and then my sisters as we came into the world. And, Life, life was on the edge then as it is today there. He took all kinds of, of, of work to do this odd jobs. He seemed to work day and night. He, was a, uh, he piloted a, a, one of the tugboats on the river that took coal down to the Ohio River and then up to Pittsburgh. He, uh, he worked for a while on a garbage truck. He, he worked in coal mines, uh, getting the coal into the trucks. He, everything he could do to just keep us healthy. And at the same time, he was trying to pastor a church because uh, uh, in those days, almost all churches, all pastors were bivocational. They had to work a job to be able to support themselves. So my dad did that as well. And then we moved into Latin America and my, my lifelong uh, struggles with that move has both blessed my life and complicated it, but at any rate, it's made me who I am. A few, a couple of years ago, my dad said, I know that this was, that move was hard and it's had consequences on the family since, but he said, I had to get the family out of poverty and get them to a place where their vision would be expanded. And my father was insistent that we have a global vision, that we understood that we live in an entire world, that there was other countries, that there were other peoples, that there were other languages, that other people ate different foods, that there were other opportunities in other places. He wanted us to expand, expand our mentality and not to be imprisoned within the kind of tribalism that characterized the life that we had had. And uh, it was a difficult decision, and he said, I know, I know it was difficult, and it's, it's, it's been difficult in many ways, but he said, we, we, we had to make this move, and uh, uh, he was explaining that to me after all these years. He had never really uh, talked about it. So my father is a keeper of the spring. I just want to tell you why that's important and why it's important for us to take, to take note today that fathers, especially mothers, people who are in leadership, we are, we are responsible before God to be upright in the way that we do things, 
to be ethical and moral in our conduct. We are responsible before God to not pollute the stream of life and to walk in an orderly way, the best way we can. My father's not a perfect man, but I wanna talk about a few ways that my father deserves, in my opinion, to be called a wise man and also to be called a keeper of the spring. First, my father has yearned to be a good man. You will not be a good man or a good woman if you do not wish to be. One of the great truths of the gospel that worldly people and a lot of Christians now do not like is the Christian teachings that we're, that teaching that we are all born bent. You say, well, I just think people are born basically good. Well, you haven't lived long enough or you've been blind or deaf or something. People are not basically good. St. Augustine said the innocence of childhood is due to the weakness of limb. <laughs> the heart is deceitful above all things and who can know it? You will go wayward if given the chance. What keeps you honest and upright are the, are the kind of accountability structures that you, that, that you have known since childhood and that you are in. And given the opportunity, it, it's demonstrated again and again, we will go wayward. When we have total power and we, are, we don't, are not accountable to anybody and we can do anything we want to, we tend to go wrong way. All right. Isn't that right? So you have to yearn, you have to yearn, you have to desire goodness. You have to desire to be a holy person, to be a holy person. Now, you are not going to be a perfect person in this life, even if you desire to be a godly person. But if you don't desire, you will not be. And I don't care how often you go to church. I don't care how many boards you get voted on. I don't care how many times you get ordained, baptized, take communion. If you don't wish to live a holy life, you will not live a holy life. End of story. My father has yearned to be a good man, and what does that do? That makes you willing to ask people for forgiveness. It means that you apologize when you do the wrong thing. My father's a very strong man. He was a mountain man. He can walk in the forest and tell you if a bear's been there or not. Or at least he said, man, now I'll think about it. Maybe he was just making it up. I don't know. <laughs> because he could say, oh, there's been a bear here. You know, there, there's... there's raccoons over there. There's like, there's berries. These are edible. He knows all that because he, he, he lived in that kind of world for a good part of his life. And he can go anywhere. He was lost in the George Washington forest one time, been lost in the Amazon jungle basin, always finds his way out. He knows how to do that. He can start a campfire. He can uh, stay at night in the middle of places where there's dangerous animals and all those kinds of things. He can, he can do all that. So he's a very strong person, but my father's never been too strong to ask people's forgiveness when he has done something wrong. Why? Because he yearns to be a good man, and a man that does not apologize is not a good man. End of story. When you do wrong, you've got to ask forgiveness, God's forgiveness, and the forgiveness of others. Second thing, my father has never stopped learning. Um, you know, it, this is, our, uh, my father was born and raised in a community where they had ancient knowledge of stuff that many people now have lost. Like I said, he can, you can let him loose in the forest. He can be there several days. He's going to be okay. Even now, some of the folks from our church that went to my mother's funeral and which my mother buried on the hillside and, and uh, my dad just, you know, just springing around and going around. He's 87. He's fine. He says last year, he's said this every year for many years, this is the last year that he will put lights up at Christmas time on the roof. Uh, a, a few years ago, my mother called me and said, would you talk to your dad? Uh, he's up in the tree with a chainsaw. He's going to cut off his leg. Would you talk to him? I said, sure. Then I'm like, how does one, uh, how, oh, holy cow, what, what does one do about this? So anyway, I'm talking about dad later. Dad said, son, I'm going to have to quit using the chainsaw, I think. He said, I, I, I just don't have the balance I used to at 84. That's reasonable. Uh, and, uh, and he said, I, I almost slipped up on that, uh, in the tree. I had the chainsaw, so I'm going to go ahead and get rid of my chainsaw. And I'm like, who? And so, so think about this, this kind of self-knowledge that one has, but you never stop learning. Learning about self. Learning about your character. 
learning what are your strengths and your weaknesses, learning uh, about what, what other people think and why they think it, and listening to them with respect. You may not agree with them, but you listen to them and figure things out and figure how you disagree with them and why before you open your mouth and get in a fuss with them. My father has never stopped learning. In his mid-30s, he went abroad with his family and, uh, and I mean, that would, have, that would scare me to death right now. My father took uh, uh, two children, uh, three children and a wife and went to the Andes Mountains and to live. Now, if you've never lived as an immigrant, you can't imagine what living like an immigrant in any country is like. There's people that will be nice to you and so forth, but most people are like, why don't, why don't you learn to talk if you're not learning the language? You're learning, you're doing your best, but it never satisfies the natives very much. You've got to get there. And, and you're, you're constantly trying. You're, you're in the foreign environment. You're thrust in situations you don't understand. You make mistakes. You insult people you don't mean to. You don't like their food. You learn to like their food. You try not to make faces. You want your own food. And then uh, they don't like your food. And you you got to get through all of that. My father that did this in his mid-30s and he mastered another language so that he could preach the gospel in another, in another place and he built little churches and little schoolhouses all over Ecuador and started with a handful of people, less than 20, and today uh, I, I think they said, I don't know, it's uh, 100,000, whatever people it is, a lot, a lot of people. He never stopped learning. Uh, he, when my mother was... Uh, um, dying a couple of weeks ago and I left church and I was on my way to St. Louis. Uh, my dad uh, was texting and Trish would read it and she said, you know, your dad thinks you're, you're driving too fast. How does he, why does he think I was driving too fast? He was on Find My Friend. <laughs> so my father, like Santa Claus, knows when you're sleeping and knows when you are awake. If they, so the grandkids, great-grandkids come in with gadgets, he's going to find out how to use them and he's, and he's going to surprise them and show that he, he has never stopped learning. Here's the third thing. My father kept, has kept his commitments. For the last three years, in his late 80s, it's been especially challenging. My dad has lifted my mother physically, getting her in and out of bed and at night to the restroom and all that, has kept a record of all of her medications, for three years, he was her primary caregiver. He did an outstanding and excellent job. And um, what, what, in sickness and health, for rich or for poor, we make these commitments. We never really expect it's going to be in sickness. My father saw my mother through from the altar all the way to her walking across the River Jordan and, and blessed her as she went. He's kept his commitments to us. Does not wisdom call? This is the kind of stuff we don't hear in our age that's very important. I tell you what, I don't care how often you speak in tongues, how many visions you have, that you're, you have the right Christian doctrines, you go to the right church, you've got all that figured out. If you don't know this stuff, you don't know squat. Me too, right? Because this is... This is the heart of the gospel teaching us of the kind of character we must have, and we do not have it naturally. Without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, without learning the Word of God, without the accountability of our brothers and sisters in Christ that call us to be better than we are today, we will stop growing. How many people you know that are, are a 65-year-old adolescent? Wisdom calls... But how many respond to the call? The world will not applaud you for your desire to be wise. There will be opportunities that you will pass up because they call for too much sacrifice of character and ethics. There will be pleasures and joys of life that you forego because you've made other commitments to be a different kind of person. In the long run, you will have the label that the Lord talks about righteous mothers, that your children will rise up and call them blessed. And I tell you what, in my family system, all of the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and nephews and nieces and 
There's tons of, I've got 54 cousins on one, one side of family alone. My dad and his brother, because we had a godly grandmother too, you see. This goes back. When these people walk in a room, people bless them. Amen. Hallelujah. Why? Because they've kept their commitments. And, and you see what that says to me, whatever, whatever accomplishments I have in life, the first thing is to act in a morally upright and an ethical manner. I would, I would like to be the best whatever, the best, you know, the most famous or whatever. We've all got, I mean, mo a lot of us have that in. But many times that takes us wayward from this first thing, keeping faith with God and with what he's asked us to do. I'm wrapping this up. The last thing I wanted to tell you is my father has continued to deepen his understanding of faith. In my mom's illness, many, many days he would talk to me about his journey of faith. And I, I marveled that he was speaking differently than he would have spoken 20 years ago, 30 years ago. How many of us, we, what we learned about God, you know, 30 years ago is really everything still the same. We haven't, we haven't even allowed the crucible of life and our challenges of life to, to, to challenge and make us think it through and, 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 and rework how we, we see the scriptures and how we're walking uprightly before God. We're just stuck and call that fidelity. That's not fidelity. That's just stuck. John 16, 12 through 15, the Lord Jesus says, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. So the Lord Jesus was saying, the Holy Spirit is coming and you're going to learn things that you don't, you're, you're not getting right now because you're not ready for it. If Jesus could say that to his disciples, he was with them for three years and he could say, there's things you're not ready for, but you'll get them. The spirit of God's going to come and going to lead you and then, and you'll get them then. How much more are those of us who have been walking with God know that we do not have the final word on what we understand about God, how we're supposed to behave, the practices of our faith. There's always much to learn. Goodness requires training. And training requires a willing heart, an engaged heart. And before me, all my life, I have had an example, a model of the best man I know. And I, I want to be a model like that to my children and grandchildren. When it comes my time to close my eyes for the last moment on this earth, I want my children and grandchildren, not that they'll agree with me in everything, they don't and they won't because they're growing. If they agreed with everything I said, then it's not, they're not growing. I've just made a little cult out of my family. They will cooperate anyway, so with that. So. so it's not about agreement and disagreement. It's about, in the end, one thing I'd say about my father, not everybody follows his same spiritual path in the family, but not a one of them would not say, this is a godly man, this is a man of worth, this, this is someone to emulate, this is somebody that does life well. I've had an example, a model, and I want to be that. And one of the ways that we model that is to be, keep our commitments uh, of time. And our time has run out. So I want to sing this song in closing to you that the first time I heard it really moved me. It's a simple little song. You know it. And uh, when we think about what the Proverbs teaches us and how the Lord wants us to live I guess, and the final word is your pastor. I want to say what um, the word of the Lord says to mark out those among you that live godly lives and follow their example. And uh, you're getting a pastor who is younger than I, so he's, he's, uh, he's behind me in the journey of life in that sense. But already he's shown great marks 
of desire to be a godly person. He has character. He has wisdom. And he will feed you and he will, he will prepare his messages. I'm so grateful that this church has had such a wise and discerning heart to bring to it such a person of such character as Ben and Aaron and his entire family. But there's others here too. You have as good a staff as I've ever seen in any church at any time that I've ever served anywhere with anyone. They, they, they're, they're good and godly people. You have a great board. These are wonderfully wise people. I had my last board meeting with them the other night. They're, they're just wise and, and they continue to evolve in ways that makes the board more what it should be and to carry appropriately the kind of corporate weight that the board is supposed to carry. And our deacons, they they, I mean, they show up when we're sick. They come to us uh, when we're uh, needing help, and, and, and they go to w widows' homes and try to find out what needs to be fixed with what great deacons. There's this, I could go on and on. The people that serve us in the choir, and, and to, you're, you're surrounded by good, good people. And, it's, it's, and I like to think that we're better people because we're together. I'm a better person because I've worked with Christopher Phillips. He's asked me questions that, that would just stun the devil, but he's asked, he's just, <clears throat> he's asked me questions. I'm like, at the whole, I thought now, and then, but what, he, he's, he's truthfully asked me questions that an uh, inquiring, uh, knowledgeable person of his generation needed to know about the gospel. And it's forced me to have to go get answers, and it's, and, and I could say about Hunter and the way, and, and every single one of our folks and working with them, how they've made me a better person. So it's not just let flows like from the pastor, like down to everybody, like it also flows back because in a community, when we have examples of godliness and goodness that keep the stream pure, God's presence comes and we grow in Christ. Would you stand? Ancient words long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of life, words of hope. Give us strength, help us cope in this world. Where'er we roam, ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh let the ancient words Holy words of our faith handed down to this age came to us through sacrifice. Oh, heed the faithful words of Christ. Holy words long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound. With God's own heart, oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with hope in heart, oh, let the ancient words impart. Lord, I thank you for this wonderful congregation that for 35 years since 1984 I have walked in life in this midst and in the years that I was in Phoenix with another congregation where people did the same for me there and Lord in all these years it's been your people that have continued to mold me sometimes in blessing sometimes in controversy that have made me continually to return to you and I thank you for it but I want to especially thank you today 
for my father and my mother who in their early years of life opened up my mind and heart, taught me to love to read, taught me to pray, taught me to be truthful and to ask people's forgiveness, taught me to live in community with others, taught me to live with difference. I thank you for them. Thank you, Lord, that my mother was faithful to you and is now with you. And I thank you, Lord, for my father who continues the journey and by your grace, you've given him more time with us. And as long as he's with us, I pray, oh God, that his life would continue to be blessed, radiate out, thanksgiving and joy. And the people like this, like Bill Hughes here with us, Lord, very similar kind of person. I could talk about him today. So many in Jack Hughes. So many people, godly, good men and good women in this church that have been good, healthy examples of life. Now, Lord, help us not to be fools. Help us to have eyes and heart and ears wide open and to follow the people who have been characterized by the touch of wisdom and grace in their life and follow them all the way home until we hear you say to them and to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace and serve the Lord.